When it comes to shipping canals, there are few that are busier and more famous than the Suez Canal, located in Egypt and connecting the Mediterranean Sea to the Red Sea, vastly shortening shipping times as it was no longer required for ships to travel around the southern coast of Africa when going from, say, Italy to Indonesia. Because of its strategic and economic importance, the Suez Canal has been a great source of tension for many years and one of the most defining instances of this was the Suez Crisis of 1956. Before we dive into the crisis though, let's lay some groundwork. The modern Suez Canal was built between 1859 and 1869, largely constructed and funded by the French, and thus was under French control upon its completion. The Suez Canal Company, established in Paris, was majority owned by French shareholders, with the Egyptian Khedive owning 44% of the company equity. It is important to note at this point that the Suez Canal Company was set to be reverted over to Egyptian control after 99 years, meaning in 1968. The Suez Canal later fell under British control after this 44% stake was sold to them during a large economic downturn in 1875, and soon after in 1882, the British invaded Egypt and gained de facto control of both Egypt and the Suez Canal. The Convention of Constantinople in 1888 declared that the Suez Canal would be a neutral zone, under British protection of course, and British control over the canal was reasserted several decades later in the Anglo-Egyptian Treaty of 1936. This treaty also stipulated that the British move all of their troops out of Egypt, except what was necessary to protect the Suez Canal and surrounding area, as well as train and arm the Egyptian army in the event of war. This treaty was set to last 20 years, giving the British military control of the canal until 1956. In September of 1945, the Egyptian government wanted to modify the treaty and require that Britain's military be entirely removed, and after a new Egyptian parliament was elected in 1950, the Anglo-Egyptian Treaty of 1936 was repudiated by this government. The British, however, refused to leave the Suez region, leading to riots in the capital of Cairo, which was used as a springboard for a coup d'etat against the Egyptian monarchy by a group of military officers. Soon afterwards, the king was overthrown, with Mohammed Naguib as president, who was soon replaced by Gamal Abdul Nasser, a key player in the upcoming crisis. In October of 1954, the new Egyptian government, along with the British, made the Anglo-Egyptian Treaty of 1954, which did two main things. It required that British troops be moved out of the Suez region over the next 20 months, and it allowed for certain military base installations to be kept at a state of readiness by civilians in the event that Britain needed to reassert military control because of an external invasion. Now we're getting close to when the match hits the powder keg, but let's dissect what the powder keg actually consists of first. There were a few major international political considerations at play with everything going on. For one, this is the 1950s, and currently the USA and USSR are playing a game of global domination, trying to exert their influence on as many nations as possible to lock the other out of said nations. Similarly, there was a sort of smaller Cold War going on within the Arab world as to who would be the dominant power in the region in a post-colonial world, with Egypt eyeing themselves as being that dominant power. Then, there's also the tension between the newly created State of Israel and the Arab nations surrounding it, especially since the first Arab-Israeli war had only concluded a few years prior in 1949. One final thing to consider is the struggle for France and Britain to not lose total control of their colonial holdings in a rapidly decolonizing world. At this point in history, the United Kingdom was often considered a third world power, along with the United States and Soviet Union, though their star had been and would continue to be fading. Another large source of tension, more specifically, was the construction of the Aswan High Dam, a dam that was going to be built on the Nile with funding promised by the United States and United Kingdom. This is widely considered to be where the match got struck. The United States had a vested interest in funding Egyptian projects at the time, as it was a policy of the Eisenhower administration to try and cozy up to Egypt, as Nasser's government was seen by the American government as a very obvious and strong bulwark against Soviet influence in the region. As such, the US also offered to help arm the Egyptian military, 
but under specific stipulations of how and where they could use the weaponry. These stipulations proved to be too stifling for Nasser, so instead they purchased military arms from the Soviet Union through Czechoslovakia, causing the British government to pull funding from the Aslan Dam and for the United States to become incredibly wary. The final straw for the Eisenhower administration was after Nasser recognized the People's Republic of China, as it was at that point official American foreign policy that the only recognized China was the Republic of China. This caused the United States to pull funding from the Aswan Dam, and in June of 1956, the Soviet Union sweeped in and offered their own financial aid for the project. Something important to note here is that Nasser had no intention of entirely siding one way or another in the Cold War. Rather, he was hoping to play the USSR and USA off of each other to the benefit of Egypt. But now that both UK and US funding had been pulled from the dam, Nasser made his next big move. And on July 26th, 1956, eight days after the final British troops had left the Suez region, the Egyptian government nationalized the Suez Canal, disallowing any Israeli shipping through the canal and freezing all assets tied to the canal, paying back stockholders based on the present value of the stock. Not long after this nationalization, secret talks began between the United Kingdom under Prime Minister Anthony Eden, who had an obvious interest in maintaining control of the Suez Canal, France, under Prime Minister Guy Mollet, who believed Nasser was supporting rebels in Algeria and also shared with Britain a concern for maintaining overseas possessions, and Israel, under Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion, who was hoping to strengthen the country's foothold in the region. Eventually, a plan was devised known as the Protocol of Save. The plan was simple. On the 29th of October, Israel would launch a surprise invasion of the Sinai Peninsula in Egypt, and on the 30th of October, Britain and France would deliver a joint ultimatum, demanding that both Egypt and Israel withdraw to 16 kilometers away from the Suez Canal zone, under the guise of being mediators of sorts between the two nations. Then, on the 31st of October, Operation Musketeer would begin. Operation Musketeer consisted of three phases. Phase 1. Anglo-French air forces would quickly gain superiority over Egypt. Phase 2, the Joint Air Force would then launch a 10-day campaign to cripple Egypt's economic capacity. Finally, Phase 3, airborne and seaborne troops would land at the Suez Canal zone and capture it. So, on the 29th of October, as planned, Israel launched its surprise invasion of the Sinai Peninsula landing paratroopers in the Suez region itself as well as mounting a land invasion from the east. As hoped, the attack caught the Egyptian military off guard and the Israeli military made significant headway. Then, on October 30th, Britain and France delivered the ultimatum demanding that the Suez Canal zone be vacated of Egyptian and Israeli troops for at least 16 kilometers. One day later, the joint military began its air campaigns over Egypt. Nasser responded to this air invasion by closing the Suez Canal entirely, sinking ships that were presently in the canal in order to block it from any potential travel. At this point, Phase 1 of Operation Musketeer was underway, and within a very short amount of time, daytime airstrikes all but entirely destroyed Egyptian aircraft that were still sitting on the ground, crippling the Egyptian Air Force, leading to Phase 2. Soon after the campaign to destroy Egypt's economy was underway, France's leading general, André Beaufray, said that they should expedite the operation of Phase 3, and move troops to take the canal sooner rather than later. Eventually, the other leaders of the operation were convinced, and on the 5th of November, British paratroopers were dropped in the Suez Canal region where they would later be reinforced by seaborne troops who arrived the next day by landing craft. At this point, Nasser was calling for a civilian defense of the nation calling it a people's war, putting Britain and France in a tough spot both politically and militarily. Now that they wouldn't be able to distinguish regular civilians from those who were taking up arms against the invading European nations, this made the war look like even more of a humanitarian disaster than it already had been. This also led to significant amounts of guerrilla fighting and sniper fire bogging down Anglo-French military movements. Luckily for the Egyptians, the rest of the world was not taking to this situation too kindly. Almost immediately, the war was incredibly unpopular in Britain, with many political officials frustrated that Eden had kept them in the dark about all of this, and with the public seeing the fighting as pointless and malicious. 
a sentiment mirrored throughout much of the Commonwealth. In non-Commonwealth nations, the reaction wasn't good either. The United States government was incensed by the fact that the UK had gone ahead with an invasion without ever consulting with or talking to the US about it, along with the fact that it was US policy to try and foster good relations with nations in the Middle East. Richard Nixon, vice president at the time, said, We couldn't on one hand complain about the Soviets intervening in Hungary and, on the other hand, approve of the British and the French picking that particular time to intervene against Nasser. The Soviet Union itself was also infuriated by this invasion, and threatened military action on the side of Egypt, as well as nuclear retaliation against all involved nations. On the 30th of October, both the US and USSR submitted drafts to the UN Security Council, calling for Israel to withdraw from the Sinai Peninsula. After the situation escalated with the Anglo-French air invasion on October 31st, an emergency special session was called, which resulted in the United States' resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire, the withdrawal of all forces, an arms embargo, and the reopening of the Suez Canal to be adopted on the 2nd of November. In the upcoming days, the first UN emergency force was created to help facilitate a peaceful de-escalation and retransition of power over the Suez Canal and surrounding areas. In addition to using United Nations channels, the US government also threatened to use its influence in the IMF to cut off access to financial assistance, as well as sell off all of its sterling bonds which would greatly devalue British currency. Saudi Arabia also announced an embargo on oil to Britain and France, to which the US responded saying they would not offer any oil to fill a deficit either nation may have, with many other NATO nations following suit. Eventually, without communicating first to France or Israel, the British declared a ceasefire for themselves on November the 6th. It was eventually made known that the Anglo-French forces would have to be out of the area by the 22nd of December, being replaced by units of the UN Emergency Force. Israel took longer to withdraw, leaving the Sinai Peninsula in March of 1957, enacting a sort of scorched earth campaign on their way back, destroying large amounts of infrastructure and taking Egyptian locomotives and other equipment to use on their own railways. The Suez Canal was eventually opened in April of 1957, around five months after the fighting had begun. Eden would resign from his prime ministership over this debacle in January of 1957, it also set the stage for the fall of the Fourth French Republic, but that's a story for another time. What did this mean in the long term, however? Well, for one, the Suez Canal is still under Egyptian control. Other than that, this is believed to have led to a rapid decolonization of former European colonial holdings, specifically those of Britain and France. In Britain, even though the military side of the conflict had been a resounding success, it had left the once proud British Empire utterly embarrassed on the international stage. To many, it was a sign that they were no longer a first-rate superpower of their own accord, but another nation within the American sphere of influence in this post-World War II world. The heavy amount of criticism that was levied against Eden's government also led to a sort of revanchism among British conservatives. Winston Churchill commented that, while he might not have ever enacted this military action in the first place, he said that if he had done it, he would have gone the entire way, and not go only halfway. Margaret Thatcher stated, in regards to the Suez Crisis, having previously exaggerated our power, we now exaggerated our impotence. And ultimately this describes a large portion of British conservatism around this period, looking for a chance to reprove itself as a political power in large part likely leading to the Falklands War in 1982. Thatcher herself stated that the significance of the Falklands War was enormous, both for Britain's self-confidence and for our standing in the world. Since the Suez fiasco in 1956, British foreign policy had been one long retreat, which while obviously only one side of this whole equation, does indicate just how far British prestige had fallen both within and without their nation. Although the British would attempt to reground themselves as an international power, the Suez Crisis is seen broadly as the point in international relations of the Cold War that there were only two big dogs on the block. Thank you very much for watching. Leave a like if you enjoyed my video and subscribe to my channel with notifications turned on to see more of my content. Leave a comment with your thoughts on this video or topics for the future and if you're interested I've also made plenty of other videos so go check those out too.
This has been Historical Hindsight, and I'll be seeing you soon.